Hi guys. It is a pleasant spring morning here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in the Orwellian nightmare lockdown here in uh, Garfield, Texas on this soon to be stormy tornado <clears throat> hailstorm racked uh, spot in the middle of Texas, but it is a fine morning right now for your old apocaloptimist Sam Mitchell. That is me here at the Coronavirus Chronicles where your old apocaloptimist, probably the only person on the planet holding an open house today trying to sell a house in a collapsed real estate market. And this is my little co-pilot Sancho Panza helping me out with that. And uh, <clears throat> So, then I say it's April 11th, 2020, and so for today's edition of the Corona Panic Chronicles, I'm uh, having trouble uh, deciding between three three stories. I've got I've got the 300,000 uh, <clears throat> articles and whatnot about the Corona Panic whittled down to three. I think I will just touch on the first one, a little bit more on the second one, and we'll wind up with the third one. So the first one uh, kind of says it all <clears throat> from the good old Associated Press. What is going on in sub-Saharan Africa today, in Kenya in particular? Stampede in Kenya as slum residents surge for food aid. Uh, imagine that. Thousands of people surged for food aid, otherwise stampeded for food aid in a stampede Friday in Kenya's capital, desperate for help as coronavirus lockdowns keep them from making a living. Police fired tear gas and injured several people, witnesses said, blah, 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 residents of Nairobi's Kibera slum, spotting a food distribution, tried to force their way through a gate outside a district office for their chance at supplies to keep their families fed for another day. And so, of course, what that's about is, uh, so I guess, what are they, 10 days into this Orwellian lockdown uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, where you are going to see many more people, perhaps millions more people starve to death than ever would have died in the coronavirus itself as a catastrophe of, of biblical proportions setting up in sub-Saharan Africa today. But we're going to go uh, from uh, sub-Saharan sub Africa to the good old United States of America, uh, although some reference is made to uh, places like Kenya. This is from the New York Times Magazine with this article, Restarting America Means People Will Die. So, when do we do it? So, five in this article, five thinkers weigh moral choices in a crisis. Moral choices in a crisis. So anyway, they uh, have a, they interview these five people in a, in a round table, uh, Four of them pretty much, you know, just echoing the, uh, you know, cheering on the Orwellian police state and, and just, you know, playing right in line with the fear stream media, including the New York Times. But I'll have to give some credit to the New York Times and this fellow Peter Singer. Peter Singer is a bioethics professor at Princeton University, author of The Life You Can Save, and founder of the charity of the same name. So, uh, 
And what the, the topic of discussion is, what are the trade-offs of reopening the economy in the near future? It's not really defined, but more or less figure May 1st. So they, this is the, the discussion they're having with these five people. Uh, so I'm going just to read Peter Singer's input. And then we're going to move on to Caitlin Johnstone's uh, essay today. Take it away, Peter Singer. If we're thinking of a year to 18 months of this kind of lockdown, then we really do need to think about the consequences other than in terms of deaths from COVID-19. I think the consequences are horrific in terms of unemployment in particular, which hit 16 million Americans this week, which has been shown to have a very serious effect on well-being, particularly for poorer people. Are we really going to be able to continue an assistance package to all those people for 18 months? That's a question each country will have to answer. Maybe some of the affluent countries can, but we have a lot of poor countries, can you say, Kenya, that just have no possibility of providing that kind of assistance for their poor people. That's where we will get into saying, yes, people will die if we open up, but the consequences of not opening up are so severe that maybe we have got to do it anyway. If we keep it locked down, then more younger people are going to die because they're basically not going to get enough to eat. Can you say food riots in Kenya 10 days into the lockdown or other basics? So those trade-offs will come out differently in different countries. I'm not, uh, I think he m m might not be understanding uh, how close the U.S. is to, uh, is to Kenya. <clears throat> we need to think about this in the context of the well-being of the community as a whole. <clears throat> we are currently impoverishing the economy which means that we are reducing our capacity in the long term to provide exactly those things that people are talking about that we need. Better health care services, better social security arrangements to make sure that people are not in poverty. There are victims in the future after the pandemic who will bear these costs. The economic costs we incur now will spill over in terms of loss of lives, loss of quality of life, and loss of well-being. I think that we're losing sight of the extent to which that is already happening, and we need to really consider that trade-off. <clears throat> I think the assumption that we have to do everything to reduce the number of deaths is not really the right assumption. Hmm. Because at some point we are willing to trade off loss of life against the loss of quality of life. No government puts every dollar it spends into saving lives and we can't really keep everything locked down until there won't be any more deaths. So I think that's something that needs to come into this discussion. How do we assess the overall cost to everybody in terms of loss of quality of life, loss of well-being, as well as the fact that lives are being lost? Uh, and then they go through the uh, bleeding sheep, the other people uh, on the panel. Okay. <clears throat> when people look at the number of deaths from coronavirus and they say 
you know, this is comparable to the Vietnam War. Well, the Vietnam War killed mostly younger people. This is killing mostly older people. I think that is really relevant. I think we want to take into account the number of life years lost, not just the number of lives lost. The average age of death from COVID in Italy is 79 and a half years old. So you do have to ask the question, how many years of life were lost? Especially when you consider that many of the people who have died had underlying medical conditions. The economist Paul Frieders roughly estimates that Italians lost perhaps an average of three years of life and that's very different from a younger person losing 40 years of life or 60 years of life. <clears throat> I'm in the 70 plus age group, so I am at high risk. But you know, by summer or fall, grandparents may be prepared to say, okay, I think it's really important that my kids don't miss out on their education and that would be a reason for saying the lockdown should not continue for very long in the total state that it's in in many places such as Garfield, Texas. Actually Garfield, Texas, it just seems like uh, another day on the planet here in Garfield as they say you know we are we've been on the edge of Mad Max out here in Garfield for so long <clears throat> You know, just another day of Mad Max ramping up out here. Okay, let's go over to Caitlin Johnstone. Uh, I've heard her called a journalist and a columnist. Uh, Kate Johnstone, uh, I think she would consider herself a lefty snowflake. Uh, so what is on the minds of the lefties, the young lefty snowflakes such as Caitlin Johnstone, who uh, does a survey of some articles that she uh, liked that she's going to share a bunch of quotes with us. <clears throat> they are rolling out the architecture of oppression now because they fear the people. So we're going to start out with a quote. This is NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden. <clears throat> quote, as authoritarianism spreads, as emergency laws proliferate, as we sacrifice our rights, we also sacrifice our capability to arrest the slide into a less liberal and less free world. Do you truly believe that when the first wave, the second wave, the 16th wave of the coronavirus is a long forgotten memory that these capabilities will not be kept, that these data sets will not be kept, no matter how it is being used, what is being built is the architecture of oppression. Close quote. Here she's quoting an art, a recent article from Bloomberg. <clears throat> Apple Incorporated and Google unveiled a rare partnership to add technology to their smartphone platforms that will alert users if they have come into contact with a person with COVID-19. People must opt into the system, but it has the potential to monitor about a third of the world's population. Okay, here is quoting a recent Venture Beat article, article titled, After Coronavirus, AI Could Be Central to Our New Normal. Quote, World Health Organization Executive Director Dr. Michael Ryan said surveillance is part of what is required for life to return to normal in a world without a vaccine. 
However, civil liberties experts warn that the public has little recourse to challenge these digital exercises of power once the immediate threat has passed. Okay, what is Politico? Uh, how are they weighing in this week? Quoting from it, and she has links to all. I'm going to put the link to Caitlin's. Uh oh, I don't know. I don't know how to put the link. You just have to go on to Caitlin Johnstone, and uh, and she has links to these full articles. So this is an article from Politico this week. Quote: White House Senior Advisor Jer Jared Kushner's task force has reached out to a range of health technology companies about creating a national coronavirus surveillance system to give the government a near real-time view of where patients are seeking treatment. I love, uh, I love Garfield, Texas. And for what? and whether hospitals can accommodate them according to four people with knowledge of the discussions. But the prospect of compiling a national database of potentially sensitive health information has prompted concerns about the impact on civil liberties well after the coronavirus threat recedes, with some critics comparing it to the Patriot Act enacted after the 9-11 attacks. Okay, this is Sam Biddle, whoever he is, writing in The Intercept. Quote, Mass surveillance methods could save lives around the world, permitting authorities to track and curb the spread of the novel coronavirus with speed and accuracy not possible during prior pandemics. There is a glaring problem. We have heard all of this before. After the September 11th attacks, Americans were told that greater monitoring and data sharing would allow the state to stop terrorism before it started leading Congress to grant unprecedented surveillance powers that often fail to pre prevent much of anything. The persistence and expansion of this spying in the nearly two decades since and the abuses exposed, exposed by Snowden and others remind us that emergency powers can outlive their emergencies. Okay, so now Caitlin Johnstone uh, takes over to see how she's interpreting all of this. <clears throat> it is an established fact that power structures will seize upon opportunities to roll out oppressive authoritarian agendas under the pretense of protecting ordinary people when in reality they had been working on advancing those agendas since long before the crisis being offered as the reason for them. It happened with 9-11 and we may be certain that it is happening now. The reason for this is simple. The powerful are afraid of the public. They always have been. For as long as there has been government power, there has been the fear that the people will realize the power of their numbers and overthrow the government that is in power. And understandably so, it has happened many times throughout history. This is n more the case now than ever. The oppressive, exploitative nature of neoliberalism has created a dissatisfaction that has converged with humanity's historically unprecedented ability to network and share information, 
which has seen anti-government protests and movements arising all over the world despite the long-standing media blackout of the Yellow Vest protest in France, you may be absolutely certain that eyes widened and leaders snapped to attention all around the planet when the words, we have chopped off heads for less than this, were scrawled in graffiti on the Arc de Triomphe during the early days of that demonstration. Leaders are made vastly more fearful and skittish by the fact that this dissatisfaction with the current world order just happens to be occurring at a time when that world order is already at its most tenuous point in decades. With a surging China poised to surpass the U.S. as a superpower on the world stage and collaborating with Russia and other unabsorbed nations to create a truly multipolar world, it becomes much more difficult to control dominant narratives in a way that can effectively manufacture consent for the aggression that will be necessary to freeze and reverse this shift away from unipolar domination when the denizens of that unipolar empire are out in the streets demanding its downfall. And so, of course, internet censorship is being ramped up as well, with the mass media demanding that plutocrat-owned tech companies do more to combat coronavirus disinformation, and these government-allied tech giants are all too happy to oblige. In a recent escalation in this ongoing trend, YouTube changed its rules and began deleting videos accordingly after David Icke said there is a connection between coronavirus and 5G in a controversial video. Uh, <clears throat> YouTube is owned by Google, which has been a military intelligence contractor with ties to the CIA and NSA since its very inception. You don't have to like David Icke or his views to be repulsed by the idea of this institution manipulating human commu communication with an increasingly iron fist. <clears throat> The escalations in internet censorship and the escalation in surveillance are both directed at a last ditch effort to control the masses before control is lost forever and neither are intended to be rolled back when the threat of this virus is over. People are now off the streets with their communications being restricted and the devices they carry in their pockets being monitored with more and more intrusiveness. There are, of course, some good faith actors who do legitimately want to protect people from the virus, just as there were some good faith actors who wanted to protect people from terrorism after 9-11, but where there is power and the fear of the public, there will be an agenda to reel in the freedom of the math masses. Journalist Jonathan Cook said it best when he wrote, Our leaders are terrified, not of the virus, but of us. And uh, surely this is not someone showing up at this open house. Nope, of course that's not anybody showing up at this open house. So anyway, uh, I need to wrap up uh, the Corona Panic Chronicle of the day. If you enjoyed what Caitlin had to say, please spend a few seconds to thumb it up. If you did not uh, appreciate what Caitlin and uh, I'm sorry I've already and Mr. Singer had to say, thumb it down. And please do uh, subscribe 
to the Corona Panic Chronicles fire over here, but I'm going to wrap up the Corona Panic Chronicles and put on, uh, get my team of bloodhounds and my electron microscope to see if we can find one article about the collapse of a planet anywhere, anywhere out there today. Wish me luck, and wish me luck selling my house in the collapse of the global industrial economy as the Orwellian police state has it a heyday. Bye, guys.